everybody, Kelly Rice here, but I write under my pen name, K.M. Rice. And today, I would like to talk to you about why screenwriting is essential for any prose writer, or any storyteller for that matter, because I think it could also help with poetry. Um, this is something that I learned serendipitously in my studies, and I have found it to be true again and again, and I meet a lot of other writers who, when I express this to them, they're like, yes, yes, more people need to know this. So now I'm going to share this tip with you. But first, um, I have some shout outs to do because I am running a crowdfund to turn my young adult dark fantasy novel, Darkling, into an audiobook. We only need 12% more. Like, we are 89, no, we're, yeah, we're at 89 now, so less than 12%. We're 11% away from our crowdfunding goal. Um, through the crowdfund, you can get uh, this limited edition copy of Darkling that's got extra material. You can get this beautiful artwork done by Weta Workshop artist Lindsay Crummett. She worked on The Hobbit, she worked on Avatar, she's worked on a lot of awesome films. Um, and so you can get that artwork as well, and you can obviously reserve your copy of the audiobook. But one of the rewards, which is for around 10 bucks, you can get a shout out on this vlog. And I have a couple people, more than a couple people actually, that claim that, and I'm giving them their due right now. So we've got Andrew, Ava, Annika, Peggy, and Ari. That's my shout out to you guys. Thank you so much for donating and thank you so much to everyone else who has donated too. I am just in awe of how my readership has mobilized to make this dream a reality and to make this happen. And it's just been incredible to watch. I'm really excited. I can't wait to hear the audiobook and I know you guys are going to love it too. So, I was going to say without further ado, but I can't say that yet. You know why? I took the time to put on makeup and earrings, which was no small feat because this ear, this hole in this ear likes to close. Do you guys have any advice on that? This one seems to be fine. This one periodically, like, it won't come out the other end. Do I need to get them redone or something? And also, I pinned my hair up randomly and I thought it looked really cool because I have really long hair so it's hard to ever get it to do anything like that, so I left it. But most importantly, to show you what I'm wearing, it's not necessarily a cute top. But, this is my New Zealand top, one of my shirts I got from Aotearoa. Kia ora, everyone. And uh, let's get on with it now. So, set Willow aside. When I first began hardcore studying writing, which would be, I guess technically as an undergrad in college, though I should clarify that, I wrote my first story as soon as I could write. Um, I'll have to share it with you guys at some point. It's called The Haunted House. It's completely misspelled. I also illustrated it. Um, that was kindergarten, so I was five, six. I just turned six because I think it was Halloween-ish. Um, it's a Halloween-based story at least. No surprises there, huh? And yeah, Haunted Houses. <laughs> Sometimes I worry I'm just writing the same story over and over. More on that in another vlog. But, so I have been writing as, as long as I could, um, and I've been trying to tell stories as long as I could. So creative writing, I've covered some of my history with that in my one of my other episodes about fan fiction. I started writing fan fiction when I was a teenager, and um, it was just something I always did for fun. And then it wasn't until I was a freshman, oh I loved in high school any, any assignment I got where I got to be creative. And I, I remember a specific moment, though, when I was this lost, scared little freshman at San Jose State University when, I, w I guess I was 18, and maybe 19, because I have an autumn birthday, so, you know, you have to think about these things. Um, and I remember one of my professors, she was teaching me a class called The Me Ancient Mediterranean in the Bronze Age. Did the Trojan War ever really take place? Yes, that that was the name of the class, and I loved that class. And it was sort of an introduction to the humanities and archaeology and anthropology and all that stuff. And the answer is yes. Just maybe not the one you think. There you go. Whole semester summed up. But anyway, 
One time we were walking after class and I was helping her carry her books, Dr. Olcott, I love you, and she said, you know, you really, I was struggling because I think I've talked about this before in my vlog, at the time I thought, I'm going to direct, I'm going to make movies, and then I realized, you don't have control when you're a director, you don't have, um, there's so many moving parts to a film, and I understood that there was a part of my personality that wanted to have much more influence on the storytelling. At the time I just was like, well I'm a control freak, I can't do that, but but now that I'm older and more more mature, I recognize that it was, no, I, I wanted to be um, someone with much more agency and controlling what stories were told by me and through me, because sometimes I feel like they're not actually coming from me. Um, and she told me, you know, you're a really good writer, maybe you should be an English major. And I looked through the course catalog and all the classes sounded fun. So I was like, okay, I'll be an English major. It's very broad, I don't know what I want to do yet, you know, which is laughable because my generation now and all the generations coming up after us, no one does one thing, you know, we're all going to have different careers, we're all going to make our own, not all, but many of us are going to make our own careers, which is pretty freaking cool. We're kind of trailblazers on the frontier of the new world that is globalized with the internet. But I'm digressing again. So, back to the subject at hand. With this wonderful professor's encouragement, I started taking writing more seriously, and I thought, I'm going to get in through the back door, and I am going to start by reading all the classics, which I had to do anyway for school, because I knew that my favorite authors, my favorite classical authors, before they were classics, had been schooled in the classics, so I thought, whatever fed their imaginations, I'm going to eat it too. I'm going to eat the Iliad, the Aeneid, I'm going to eat the Odyssey, I'm going to eat Beowulf, I'm going to eat um, Gil the Epic of Gilgamesh, I'm going to <laughs> expose myself to Okay, the Arthurian legends, here we go again, I'm sorry, I just said that in a weird voice because if you've seen my last vlog, you know I had a nerd rage over that and I'm just trying to keep things calm. Um, so I decided I'm going to try to digest, I guess I'm going with an eating metaphor here, I'm going to digest as many of these classics as I can and see what comes out of me. It went to the point that I even studied Latin for a year and Old English, two dead languages, studied them at the same time. I got fat, I got frustrated, and as an end result, I didn't really learn either of them. I mean, how do you decline a noun in Latin? How do you decline a, a noun in Old English? Completely different. Am I supposed to be able to keep both of those rules in my head in one semester or one year or whatever it was? I couldn't. I just couldn't. I'm not talking, okay? <laughs> so, part of this fascination with other great writers and storytelling in general led me to take a screenwriting class. I was mainly just curious, I didn't necessarily have a film in my head, you know, a lot of people are interested in screenwriting because they're like, I've got this great idea for a movie, which is awesome, um, but I, I wasn't one of those people. So I took my first screenwriting class and uh, my teacher, Barnaby Dallas, was amazing, he is amazing, and he inspired me so much that he gave me the emotional support, basically, to think, I can do this, I can write a feature-length screenplay. And at, how old would I have been? Early 20s, very early 20s. At that age, and at that stage in my writing development, I really needed that. And I don't know how, I don't know what magic he was able to do to convey that excitement and inspiration and encouragement to all of us in the classroom, but he did it. And I wrote my first feature-length screenplay. It was a comedy. It was based upon real events that had happened in my life. Funny story I'll have to tell you sometime. It's called Bus Stop. And me and my best friend were just trying to pick up my textbooks before the start of the semester in my very first year at San Jose State. And a series of very bizarre and comedic events happened, which I, of course, blew a bit out of proportion in the script. But, um, but yeah, it was based on real life, and it was a great learning experience. So it was a very small script. The next script I wrote is called Andromache. I've mentioned it before on this vlog. It is about the fall of Troy, and Tro Troy's queen, Hector, of Troy's wife, Andromache. And what does she do after she loses her people, her husband, and her child? What does she do when she is enslaved by Neoptolemus, the son of the man who killed her husband because he's Achilles' son? 
Um, I wanted to know the answer to that question, so I looked up other epic stories. There is uh, Trojan Women, a play by Euripides, and it all takes place on the beach, and Andromache and Hecuba, her mother-in-law, just get shipped off in a boat at the end to go have their horrible fates hoisted upon them. And that wasn't good enough for me. She need to fucking have revenge, man. They killed her people. They threw her child from the walls of Troy. They dragged her husband by the ankles behind a chariot until he was torn to pieces. You don't take that shit lying down. Especially not when you've got nothing to lose. And I was in one of my humanities classes studying the Iliad, hearing about this, and I, I, that's when I asked my professor, I'm like, is there more to the story? Like, what else happened? She's like, well, there's one other thing. You could read Euripides, which I did, and I was like, still, nothing, nothing, come on. I don't, I don't blame the Greeks for their culture. I don't blame the Greeks for not having a sequel that followed this powerful woman getting her revenge, but, you know, like I've said many times before, I love Gladiator. I needed this. So, there I was in my screenwriting class, and I thought, for my next script, I'm going to write the story of Andromache. And I did. And it was a massive undertaking. I understand that looking back now, but at the time I just, I just did it. Um, and it won me multiple national screenwriting awards. Um, first in state competitions, then yeah, then in national competitions, and it was very highly acclaimed. Now, Granted, a lot of the people who are reading it are other professors of screenwriting, and so there are other educated people who are probably were excited to see the myth. But also, I was able to put forth a really strong script, like I said, because of this awesome teacher. And there was an award he'd been trying to win for eight years, and he had sponsored me and I entered the competition and won it, and so he was totally psyched, as well as I was totally psyched, to finally broken that ceiling, that wall whatever. Um, and since then, my school has done incredibly well. Uh, I don't think that I left some magic behind, but the screenwriting program at San Jose State, which is not known at all for its screenwriting program, everything in Southern California is, we beat them. I beat them. Um, not saying that Southern California writing programs are bad, but when you live in Northern California and you're kind of treated as if you're inferior in some way because of your education isn't at the hands of the masters, um, you want to gloat every once in a while to say, yeah, well, I still learned it. And I think part of the reason that San Jose State students are doing so well in these screenwriting competitions is that the quality of their storytelling is setting them apart. I think that they're probably more original, unique voices than something coming out of the system that is entrenched in the Hollywood system. Um, Excuse me, I'm getting distracted because the dog is barking. Now, that's my story about screenwriting, about my little journey. Um, obviously, I wrote more scripts after that. The, sec the third script I ever wrote was called Daughters of the Wind. It was based off of a short story that I wrote, and that went on to win even more awards than Andromache. McKee. So, um, I'm... I just realized they're all on the shelf above me, gathering dust, hidden. Um, I'm not telling you all this to be like, I'm the greatest screenwriter ever, blah, blah, blah. Because as you know, I've never had a sale. But I'm telling you, you this to, to hopefully let you see how doable it is. Um, to me, screenwriting comes very naturally. And I'm not sure why that is. And I... I wouldn't normally say it came to me naturally if not for the fact that I've run, won all these awards and had this acclaim directed at me in my scripts um, because it wasn't, and there wasn't big effort involved. Um, as, as you guys who are regular watchers of this vlog know, I write very quickly. Um, Daughters of the Wind took me like three days. Um, and Drama Key probably took me a little bit longer because there was a lot more research involved. It's a historical epic. Um, bus stop took me longer than that because I was learning the ropes. So my advice to people when they're writing their first screenplay is to do what my teacher did. And I think my first ideas were much grander. I wanted to write about a young woman on a road trip to visit historical sites in the West, like in South Dakota, because I'd done this myself, and um, how she realizes that the West no longer exists other than in 
our hearts and in our spirits and in our personality. That, that freedom of the frontier and that honor of, of the battle for your homeland carried out by people like Red Cloud and Sitting Bull, that that truly lives on in the way that we live our lives, but that it doesn't no longer exists as a place. Anyone who's read The Wild Frontier, my novella, is probably going, that sounds familiar. Um, that, of course, is not the plot at all of The Wild Frontier, but it has a very similar sentiment. Um, and that's just kind of this, this passion that haunts me, this quest that haunts me every now and again. But, so that would be a very almost esoteric internal struggle to convey on film. Um, I remember our screenwriting teacher gave us the example, he was like, say you want to write a movie about um, someone trying to struggle with their their sexuality. Maybe they're gay and they're trying to figure that out. He goes, this is what it looks like. And that was a great way to show these internal struggles that we go through, that are epic in our own internal landscapes, it's not going to work on a film. It's a visual art form. Now, I know that you're probably thinking I've gone down a little bit of a path away from the subject at hand, but my point is that I'm, I'm teaching you a little bit about what got me into screenwriting so that you'll see the value of screenwriting. We can't negate the fact that we live in a, a world post-film. Uh, we are, from our earliest moments, our stories are imprinted on us through film, through television. We're a visual... A, a, visuals are a commodity in our culture. And yes, books can do so much more. Poetry can do so much more than what film can. But I think it would be neglectful to not acknowledge the fact that our readerships and in fact our own imaginations are highly visual. In a book you can portray an internal struggle uh, of someone trying to identify their sexual identity. But I think it's also important to maintain iconic visuals within novels. Let me, let me explain this a little bit more and have a sip of tea, as is my want. So when you're writing a book, when you're writing a poem, when you're writing anything, basically, other than a script or play, you can write about all the senses. You can write about what the character smells, sees, hears, touches, tastes, and further, how they feel. You can't do that in a script. What do you have in a script? Action and dialogue. That's it. That's all you've got. And in terms of action, you're heavily warned against giving any form of direction to the actor. So you can't say, um, because otherwise people get really heavy-handed, you can't say he fidgets and, and scratches his ear and that's his personality tick, and blah 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 blah. That's, that's more something that belongs in a book. You have to come up with succinct and very quick ways to convey the personality of the character in their little paragraph that introduces them. This is why I'm always encouraging prose writers, and poetry writers even, to study screenwriting, and to study it as early as they can. Because, like I said, all you have is action and dialogue, so what is that forcing you to do? kids. What's it forcing you to do? To f write the skeleton of your story. You're building the bones. And that's all a script will ever be in my mind. A screenplay, even the most beautiful polished screenplay, will only be a skeleton. If you're lucky, a skeleton that can move around on its own. When the film gets made and all the other pieces come together, then the tendons, and the ligaments, and the muscles, and the skin, and the makeup, all of that gets put onto the skeleton. But your final product is the skeleton, and sometimes that feels weird to me because it, it always feels unfinished, because 
it's just part one of many different parts. Uh, but I think it's an incredibly useful writing exercise, even if you have no intent of trying to sell a screenplay, to write your story as a screenplay and then flesh it out afterwards. And I'm telling you this because this is kind of going back to writers versus storytellers, my second vlog episode. I have encountered a lot of people who are incredibly talented writers, but their storytelling is quite um, off. Their storytelling isn't very entertaining. And it's tragic to see that combination because you know that they're going to have a limited audience. And maybe that's what they want. I mean, I'm not trying to, to shame anyone who doesn't have... You know, I'm not saying you have to have explosions and and tit sinking ships like in Titanic. I'm not saying you have to have these incredibly melodramatic elements that blockbuster films have. I'm not saying that at all. But, but I, I have read so many stories that had a strong voice and were written beautifully and were incredibly boring because nothing was happening. And there's a bunch of different reasons that people do that. Sometimes it's semi-autobiographical, um, sometimes they're writing a character based on someone they know, they're hesitant to put that person in true danger, they're hesitant to push themselves to that mental space. I've talked about this a little bit before with Darkling. Um, there are two characters in there who are sisters, and one of the sisters is dead. And I'm very close with my sister, going to that mental and emotional places I was writing was horrible. I resisted it at every turn. I tried to get around it at every turn. Um, in the end, I finally went there, at least somewhat. Because I had to, for the sake of telling the story. But that, I think, happens to a lot of people. They start to get towards the subject matter that they need to to tell the story, and then it gets uncomfortable and icky, and they back away. And that's where you've got to push and push and push through. So... Sometimes, though, it's just a lack of understanding pacing and a lack of understanding the fact that I'm going back to what I said about how the first stories that we consume are always on film. We are used to a three-act structure. We're used to the beginning, which is an introduction to the world and characters, then in screenwriting what you call the point of no return. So this is a decision the character makes. This is a disaster that happens. This is something that occurs where the world is irrevocably changed and you know that there's no going back. So the character, that begins the story. The character then must go forward. And then by the time you reach the end of the second act, you're at the lowest point, which is the point when the character feels like, and you as the audience feels like, oh my gosh, how are they going to do this? How are they going to do this? And then, if it's an American story, they figure it out. And they do it, and the third act is them solving whatever the conflict was. And it often has an uplifting ending. Um, that's how most American screenplays are written, and we have consumed this since birth. So we are looking for that three-act structure in all of our entertainment. I'm not saying that prose has to have this, or that poetry has to have this, or that nonfiction has to have this, but if you do have it, if you do have some form of a three-act structure to your storytelling, it is going to be that much more palatable, you're going to have that much of a wider audience, because it's a preconceived expectation going to any form of storytelling, whether the person is aware of it or not. So I think I've conveyed quite a bit why it's important to study screenwriting as a writer of any kind. And a lot of you are probably thinking, well, how am I supposed to do that? Um, maybe there aren't any, any classes in your area, maybe you can't afford them, maybe you have not, uh, maybe your interest isn't such that you actually want to pursue taking a class in it. That's cool. Because there are other resources like the Screenwriter's Bible. This is an old edition, because this is from back when I was in school. I don't see a year on it anywhere. That's probably best for me. Um, but uh, it has everything in here. 
Now, uh, one specific viewer asked a question. Let me look up the question. Okay, I don't know if I'm saying this name right. Adaria asked recently about phonetically written dialogue and screenwriting. Do, did I come across an industry standard that where you would write phonetic dialogue for accents or speech impediments? Um, the way that you would answer that question is to look it up in the screenwriter's bible. At least that's what I would do. Um, my answer though, because I, um, first off in their question they asked when I was doing screenwriting, I realized that it's not something that, like I said, it's part one of the finished product which doesn't exist yet. So my screenplays are not something that I'm ever publishing or that I'm ever really making you guys aware of, but I do still write screenplays. I wrote one just last summer and I wrote one two summers before that. It's just something I do when I when I come up with a story I have to consider okay how do I tell it? What's the best medium? And I spend more time on my books because that's more where my interests lie and usually the types of stories that I want to tell but every once in a while I'll have an idea that I'm like I need to write it as a script. So I'm still screenwriting actively and I um, have done it professionally. Um, I did, did a bit of it for, um, probably shouldn't say. Okay, never mind, I'm under an NDA. Anyway, screenwriting. It's great. And it keeps my storytelling muscles strong to write a script every once in a while because I get really frustrated as I'm writing it. And uh, that's always a good thing for me, I have found. Anyway, but quick answer to Adaria's question. I'm so sorry. I'm probably saying your name wrong. I think it's Adaria. Um, no. I have not come across uh, a hard and fast rule, however my rule would be to not do it. I think that it's, uh, again, like I was saying, you're, you're warned against heavily directing anything. You're not even supposed to put camera angles in a screenplay. But I would not do that. I would just put a note at the beginning that, um, okay, of mice and men, there's Lenny and there's George. So Lenny is mentally handicapped in some way. He has some form of learning disability and so his speech is impaired. Um, put that in his character description. Put it in his character description that he speaks very slowly and um, can't say the letter R or something like that. And every once in a while, if say I'm writing a, a story and it's all Americans and then there's one person with an accent, when that person's introduced, that's an opportunity to say it. To say, oh, they speak with an Irish accent or whatever. Um, and I think that anything more than that just bogs you down. And um, as you also noted in your question, it can be incredibly irritating for you as an actor or an actress to come across these sort of directions when you're trying to memorize your, um, your dialogue. And that goes back to what I was saying about how a screenplay or a script is just part one of many. And as the writer, you need to know that you're telling this story in this format because it's going to be collaborative and because you're going to then let those words be taken on by an actor and then it becomes that actor's journey to bring the character to life and I think that's a really cool thing. I actually don't know what these pieces of paper are in here. I waited to pull them out until I was on camera. Oh, oh it's... okay never mind. It's an outline for one of my scripts called The Breaches Full of Stitches, the name of a reel. If you are familiar with traditional Irish music, pages from Andromache, notes about Andromache, Ooh, Joseph Campbell and the Hero's Journey, valuable little piece of storytelling right there, a query le letter. I sent out a lot of unsolicited queries and got letters back from people's lawyers being like, we didn't read, we didn't, like I said, my first script was called Bus Stop. And so uh, I was like, hi, I was wondering if you'd be interested in reading my feature script, Bus Stop, blah, 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 blah. We didn't, they, they would write back saying, we didn't read anything. We didn't even read your letter that you sent us about Bus Stop. They didn't know it was called Bus Stop unless they read it. Well, that's the kind of treatment you get when you send unsolicited Queries, sip the big production houses, I guess. I don't know. It always made me feel hoity toity to be like, you obviously read it. Um, and that gets into a whole nother can of worms. They do that because 
then they can't, because there actually are these scumbag people who write a very generic plot, send it out to a production house, and then when the production house makes a film that is even remotely related to that story, they try to sue them and say, you read my screenplay, you read my outline, you read my whatever, my pitch, and you stole my idea. And, um, and then they, they try to sue them, so then that's why they have to have lawyers whose response is always, I did not read this. But anyway, that's that's a separate issue. So there you have it. I recommend that you buy The Screenwriter's Bible by David Trottier. Trottier? I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know French. But um, I'm sure there is a much more recent edition than this one out. Um, and if you have a look through it, it'll give you all of the... Um, information you need to know about how to write and format a screenplay. There's also an awesome free software called Celtex, which you can download at celtex.com, and that will do all the formatting for you as well. And Sid Field's Guide to Screenwriting, I think it's called, that really helped me. I'm realizing as I'm telling you that, that I actually first got interested in screenwriting as a teenager. I read a book about Nzinga who was an Angolian warrior queen who resisted Portuguese rule in her country in, I think, the 1600s. This is all from when I was a teenager. I could have gotten some of those facts wrong. And I wanted her story to be on the big screen. It needed to be told. And I, my aunt had given me this beat-up old copy from back when she was in college of Sid Field's book. And I started reading it. And I remember outlining it, going, this is the point of no return. This is the second plot point. This is that plot point. And I wrote it down on a piece of paper. And um, lo and behold, a film now exists about her. So I was on to something there. And um, for... For those of you who are interested, I was also in Script Magazine, which is a nationally published magazine. So when my screenplay at Drama Key um, came out and was winning these awards, they got all excited and they had an interview with me and I got several pages in that. And they had some professionals look at my script and give me advice on, it was called Scene Fix. And so I present to them my piece and then they have two professionals in the field look at it and give me advice and then the whole thing gets published. So that was really exciting for me. And I think that I'm gonna have to stop myself there otherwise I'll keep going into these little tangents about screenwriting because I haven't talked about screenwriting that much yet on this on this author vlog. Um, author to me denotes novels but really I am the author of screenplays as well and songs and poetry. So the writer, the storyteller. So that is why I recommend that you study screenwriting because it will really strengthen your storytelling muscles, it will ingrain in you the three-act structure, and there really is no nothing negative that I can encounter, or that I have encountered, or that I can perce per perceive? perceive that you would encounter through studying screenwriting. It will only help your craft whatever your craft may be. So I hope that some of you who haven't studied screenwriting are now interested, and I'm sure there, there are probably some free online courses. I'd like to take classes for, th for free through, I'm sorry, I can't speak now apparently. I need to eat, I'm getting low blood sugar. <laughs> for free through um, FutureLearn. So if you look up FutureLearn, they have a lot of classes available through British universities, UK universities, I think it's all Commonwealth because some are from Australia and uh, like I said it's all free you sign up for the course and then you take it at your own pace and so what always would happen to me is I would sign up for a course and then I'd have the best of intentions of keeping up and being able to participate in the, in the discussions with everyone and I would fall behind but guess what the course materials are all still available so if you what I do now is I go on there and I go, oh, that looks interesting, taking that class and that class and that class. And what that really means is that when I do have the time, I can go to that website, go to that particular class and start working my way through it or jump around to different classes. Um, so when you take the class on time, you get to in be involved in discussions and interaction with classmates. And um, But you can't see next week's material until it's released next week. But when you or lazy or busy or whatever my deal is and you just can binge class. <sighs> Most people binge watch things on Netflix and Amazon. I binge take free online classes. Well, 
I hope you all have enjoyed this vlog and that you've learned a thing or two. I'm going to sign off with something really cool that I got a few years ago. Don't know where that accent came from, forget you heard it. These are my fireflies. No, they're not real. They have a battery. And I haven't been able to find them since. I got them from the Victorian Trading Company, and I love how they just slowly go on and off. It's very soothing. Am I hypnotizing you to sleep yet? So until next time, please keep the questions coming. I love answering them. And from me and my fireflies, because it is getting into summer, we wish you a very fond farewell. Or as I should say, in keeping with my shirt, Kiora. <laughs>